Hey, it's Sam from Sugar Spun Round, and today I am showing you how to make the actual best chocolate cake. You are going to love this one. It is so moist, so fudgy. It is perfect for any chocoholic out there. So let's go ahead and get started. First things first, get your oven preheating to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's go ahead and get started with our flour. We are using all purpose flour for today's recipe. No cake flour needed. We're going to be adding one and two thirds cup. Now I am going to be using my kitchen scale, which I highly recommend you use a kitchen scale if you aren't already. It's a great way to level up your baking. So that comes out to 208 grams of flour that we're going to need. And with all of my recipes, I do list gram measurements in the printable recipe because using weight is just the best way to get consistent results. All right, the next thing that we're going to need to add is sugar. We're going to be using a cup each of firmly packed light brown sugar which should be 200 grams. Then I'll tear my scale again, and we will measure out one cup or 200 grams of granulated sugar. Next, we'll add our cocoa powder. I recommend using a natural, unsweetened cocoa powder rather than Dutch processed cocoa for this recipe. We'll be adding 3 fourths cup or 75 grams. A little bit more. And next we'll be adding one and a half teaspoons of baking soda. There is no baking powder in this recipe. And we'll also be adding 3 fourths teaspoon of salt. We're just using table salt today. I'm done with my scale for the time being. Slide that out of the way. I will link to that scale in the description because it's like under $10 and it really is a game changer in the kitchen. You can get it on Amazon. All right, now we're going to whisk these ingredients together. I want to make sure that I break up any clumps from the brown sugar and that I have everything nicely incorporated. So for today's recipe, you could make this entirely by hand, though the batter is going to get a little bit stiff when we add our next ingredient, or you can use an electric hand mixer, which is what I'll be using today, but also it could be made in a stand mixer using the paddle attachment. If you're using a stand mixer, make sure you are pausing periodically to scrape the sides and bottom of the bowl, as I find sometimes the batter likes to clump down there. I don't need this just yet, I'll go in just a second, after we add our oil and butter. So for today's cake recipe, I use a blend of both oil and butter, and that is because the oil is important for keeping the cake really nice and moist, especially if you end up refrigerating it. The butter, on the other hand, doesn't do as great of a job keeping the cake moist, but it does add a really nice flavor. So I found that doing a balance of both of these two ingredients just yields the best cake. So this is a half cup of oil. You can use any neutral cooking oil, meaning canola or vegetable or avocado oil, and avocado oil is my personal preference these days. We are also going to be adding one half cup of melted unsalted butter. And we do not waste butter around here, so I'm getting every last drop in there. Now here's where the batter is going to get a little bit stiff if you're trying to do it by hand, so I'm just going to be using my electric mixer. And I want to stir everything together until all of the dry ingredients are moistened by the butter and oil. All right, I'm gonna slide this out of the way for just a second while I prep my eggs. So for the eggs, we're going to crack them in a separate bowl. You're going to need two large eggs. And we're also going to be using one large egg yolk. So we're going to just get rid of that extra white or you can use it to make something else like I have a lot of candied, oops, I have a lot of candied nut recipes on the website that use a single egg white, so that could be a good option. I'm going to lightly beat these in the mixing bowl before I add them to the batter. Now these eggs should be room temperature, otherwise it can cause your mixture to sort of seize up and make it can make your batter not smooth like it should be. And Another thing I wanted to touch on is that I use an extra yolk for a reason, and that is because it helps make the crumb more fudgy and more moist and just more tender. Really makes for a great cake. So let's bring our batter back, and we'll add our eggs. And I'm also going to add vanilla extract. We're using two teaspoons of vanilla extract today. And all of those eggs were large eggs, in case you were wondering. One, two, and we'll stir everything together. All right, next we're going to add buttermilk. Buttermilk is so important for this recipe because again, flavor, moisture, tenderness of the crumb, important for all of those things. I do have a buttermilk substitute 
that I have shared in the past that will work for this recipe, but honestly, your best bet is to use actual buttermilk. So I'm going to stir this into my batter gradually, just because it makes it a little easier to combine if I add it a little slowly. And with this recipe, one thing I love about it is that it is very difficult to accidentally overmix your batter. So with my vanilla cake, there's a very real chance you could accidentally overmix your batter. People do it all the time when they're making traditionally cream cakes and then they end up tasting like cornbread or they end up really dense or really dry. It's not impossible to do with this cake, but it's so much harder to do it when you're making it this way. All right, the last ingredient you need for today's recipe is one half cup of steaming hot coffee. If you don't keep coffee on hand, you can use a little bit of instant coffee dissolved in super hot water. And if you just don't like coffee at all, you could even substitute hot or boiling water instead. The coffee flavor is great because it's going to accentuate the chocolate flavors and just give the cake a deeper chocolate flavor. However, the really important thing is that the liquid you're adding is nice and hot. That's because this is going to help bloom the cocoa in the chocolate cake, just give us a much deeper flavor. Let's go ahead and carefully stir this in because it is quite hot. All right, so when you're finished, you should have a nice, silky, smooth batter. And we are going to scrape the sides and bottom of the bowl with our spatula because we want to make sure we don't have any thicker batter hiding on the bottom. See, got a little bit of it there. The mixer beaters do not always get all of that for you. All right, so by now your oven should be preheated to 350 degrees. We're ready to bake our cake batter. I love baking this cake in two eight inch pans. You could alternatively bake it into nine inch pans and this makes so much batter, you could even do three a three layer cake instead of a two layer cake. I will include some notes on this in the printable recipe in case you're interested in that. So let's go ahead and try to divide this batter evenly, something I'm not great at doing. Oh, and I didn't even mention this, but as you can see, I have greased and floured the sides of the pan. It is important after greasing and flouring that you tap out as much excess flour as possible. And I really, really recommend using a round of parchment paper on the bottom. That's going to be your extra insurance that your cakes do not stick. That's where most people run into problems. And recently I've just been using butter and flour to prep my cake pans. I'm just gonna smooth the surface a little bit. And we'll take these over to our 350 degree Fahrenheit oven. They're going to need to bake in the center rack for about 35 to 40 minutes. To test that the cakes are finished baking, I like to use the toothpick test, which means we're inserting a toothpick into the center of the cake. It should come out clean or with a few moist crumbs. These look great, so I'm going to let them cool in their pans for 10 to 15 minutes. Then I will take a knife and run it around the edge of the cake and carefully invert it onto a cooling rack to cool completely. Once your cakes have cooled completely, we can go ahead and frost them. Now, with these cakes, they usually bake pretty flat, so you could get away without leveling them, but I do usually level mine anyway. And this only takes a second. You could just use a sharp serrated knife instead of this cake leveling tool, but I have this tool. It was a gift, but it's also very inexpensive. So since I have it, I use it. And leveling my cakes just means they're going to be nice and flat on top and they're not going to look weird and domed when I'm finished. For the frosting today, I am using my favorite chocolate frosting, and you can find this on my website as favorite chocolate frosting. It's nice and silky smooth. It has a rich chocolate flavor because it's made with real chocolate. You can use any frosting you'd like with this cake, but this is my personal favorite, hence the name. We don't waste icing around here either. All right, last thing I like to do is top things off with a few sprinkles. All right, let's go ahead and cut into this cake so you can see 
how nice and incredible that texture is inside. I really love this cake so much. Oh yeah. And that is how you make the actual best chocolate cake. If you try this one or have tried this one at home, please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. I really do always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. All right, my favorite part. Should get a good look at that texture. This cake is so amazing. <laughs> Just like I remembered it. You're gonna love this one. Mm.